Hello, my name is Ann Albert and I'm the CLAT Family Director for Public Programs at the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania hosting this program this evening. On behalf of the Katz Center, our co-sponsors, fellows and staff and our panelists, welcome to what we hope will be a fun and illuminating hour. At the Katz Center this year, we're exploring American Jewish culture and history under the banner of the title, America's Jewish Questions. It's a frame that invites us right off the bat to consider questions of uniqueness and exceptionalism, both Jewish and American, as well as questions of commonality and shared experience. We're doing that over the course of the entire year through a range of talks, panels, and seminars intended for both scholarly and wider audiences. So if you made your way here tonight through an interest in music, that's fantastic. And I invite you to also check out the other events that we have coming up. You will find a link to our calendar in the chat shortly. And if it's the case that you came via music, that makes sense. Music is after all a medium with so much power to draw people in and connect. That connecting, the encounter that makes music possible is what tonight's program is about. Music connects, but it can also be a vessel for particularism perpetuating traditions and conveying identity and belonging. What happens when disparate people or styles or religions meet or encounter? When people meet each other or when people encounter new styles or old traditions devolve onto new people or take root in new places or are changed by the gaze of another. The group of folks that we've brought together this evening all have unique perspectives on this kind of encounter in and around Jewish music in America. Over the next hour, we'll be privileged to hear them reflect on all of its multi-layered complexity. We'll enjoy a non-representative, but still really fascinating sample of such encounters. Um, and there will be music because our panelists have brought clips, but overall our aim this evening is to talk and reflect and explore rather than to perform or to listen. So before getting started and introducing the speakers, I just want to sincerely thank our co-sponsors and all the people who made this possible. First of all, uh, we're very grateful for a generous grant um, from the Hershey Humanities Against Racism Fund via Penn's Wolf Humanities Center. Um, we're also very grateful to support from Penn's Middle East Center, Penn's Jewish Studies Program, Penn's Music Department, the National Museum of American Jewish History, a longtime partner of the Cat Centers, and of course to the Klatt family and the Harry Stern Family Foundation that makes all of our public programming possible. So now I'll turn to introducing the people that you'll be hearing from for the rest of our, of our time together. Um, beginning with Anthony Russell. Anthony is a vocalist, composer, and arranger specializing in Yiddish song. His work in traditional Ashkenazi Jewish musical forms led to a musical exploration of his own roots through the research arrangement and performance of 100 years of African-American roots music, resulting in the album Convergence in 2018, which he produced in collaboration with the Klezmer consort called Beretsky Pass. Russell's music has brought him to stages as well as Jewish learning spaces across North America and Europe to great acclaim. Second, we have Galit Dardashti. Galit is both an anthropologist and a renowned vocalist and composer. In her academic work, she examines Israeli music and media and Mizrahi cultural politics, among other topics, and has held faculty positions and musical residencies at NYU, Rutgers, JTS, and Indiana University, where she's right now the artist in virtual residence. As founder and leader of the all-woman ensemble Divan, and through her multidisciplinary commissions, The Naming and Monajat, which I think we'll hear a little of tonight, Dardashi has earned a reputation as a trailblazing performer of Middle Eastern Jewish music. So if those two aren't different enough, the third panelist we have tonight is Shaul Magid. Shaul is professor of Jewish studies at Dartmouth College and Kogad senior research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. He's a historian of Jewish thought and religion with books on topics ranging from early Hasidism and Kabbalah to contemporary American religious identity has a book coming out this year on Meir Kahana. 
In his other life, he's also a claw hammer banjo player and a student of Ken Perlman, one of the great living banjo virtuosos and musicologists of old time banjo, as well as the musical partner of Al Jabor, who was until his death a few years ago, the curator of American folk music at the Smithsonian. Finally, as moderator this evening, we are really lucky to have with us Josh Kuhn, who is an author, curator, and cultural historian. He is professor of communication and journalism at the USC Annenberg School, where he holds the chair in cross-cultural communication and directs the popular music project of the Norman Lear Center. He was the 2019-2020 scholar in residence with the UCLA Lev Center for Jewish Studies He's the recipient of a Berlin Prize, an American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation, and a MacArthur Fellowship. So now I will turn things over to Josh and the crew and see you guys at the end. Thank you so much, Anne, um, and thank you to the CAT Center. It's so fantastic um, to be here with you all and to be a part of this incredible conversation with these incredible folks, but also to be here to engage with these critical issues, um, that Anne began with, um, under the, uh, really, I think, rich umbrella of American Jewish questions, questions that have a weight and a heaviness and an urgency, um, at this particular moment in our cultural and political history. Um, and I'm just really, um, happy and uh, kind of energized by the forward thinking way that the CAT Center is trying to uh, engage these issues head on uh, and really thrilled that we're able to be here together to talk about them. Um, I'm also thrilled uh, to see that um, in, a, in the context of a Jewish studies event, there was, a que there, there was both a statement and a question within two minutes of this webinar beginning. Um, that's a first. That was the fastest question before an event began. Um, and I see we already have three, which is, which is really amazing. So keep them coming. Um, and, uh, and I'll just be tracking the enthusiasm and interest uh, as we go along. Um, so again, a big thanks um, to Anne, a big thanks to Diana, um, who helped um, uh, really or organize and wrangle us all together. Um, we are here to talk about these four key words um, in the event title, American Jewish Musical Encounters. These are four loaded and layered and rich and complicated words. Uh, and to help understand those words and explore them, uh, we are lucky to have three musicians and thinkers and scholars for whom those words resonate in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and so what I asked in advance was to uh, have each of the panelists pick one of those words uh, and um, use that word as a guide into their work to share and introduce their work to you all. Um, so we're just going to go in order with some introductory uh, riffs and explorations, and we're going to start with Anthony. In terms of inspiration, America presents itself to me not only as a place of encounters, but also as a place of possibilities, a number of provocative questions with vibrantly illustrated unforeseeable answers. For me, one of the most interesting questions is what happens when the African diaspora meets the considerable mileage of the Jewish diaspora. Hamev and Yavin, those who know, know, but even if you think you don't know, you probably do. It's the creation of art and culture of unparalleled richness, influence, and dynamism. It's Moses, Man of the Mountain by Zora Neale Hurston. It's the Ashkenazi melody for Torah blessings in the mouths of black opera singers in Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. It's the bedrock of American culture, recently sprung from at least a couple of different kinds of ghettos onto a world that had originally shoved it into those dark and narrow places. It's something between a shimmy and a shofar between riffing on a groove and cantorial largesse. And it started here, not because of a pack of land and people owning men in wigs and wooden teeth, but miraculously, in spite of them, its contents are foreign and familiar, collaborative and appropriative, equal parts foot sore and fancy free. To give you a slightly pungent Tom, a taste of what this looks like and sounds like, I'd now like to present a video of an excerpt from an early Yiddish talkie entitled Cantor on Trial. Mm -hmm. 
both the hands, leave it in both days. Hey, leave them there. Give me that in the head. Over the past eight years, my work has been primarily as a performative advocate for the inclusion of Yiddish language and culture as a relevant facet of modern Jewish life and expression. This began, oddly enough, with a particular genre of music in Yiddish that doesn't have much of a reputation of having anything to do with modern life, Yiddish Kunstlieder, the Yiddish art song, a genre of concertized music composed to be performed primarily by classically trained vocalists. I think I was attracted to this music because it represented to me a direct parallel to the concertized African-American spiritual, a genre I was very familiar with through the artistry of Paul Robeson, Marian Anderson, Leontine Price, and many other black performers of our national musical heritage. In the Yiddish art song and the concertized spiritual, the direct pathos of the ethnic experience is raised into the ether of Western art music. In the Yiddish art song and the spiritual, I can inhabit the lives of people who persisted through the fatal vagaries of a long 19th century. My work in Yiddish art song eventually became intentionally paired and informed by sounds and texts from my own Yerusha, my own heritage and inheritance as a black person in America, where I could explore the possibilities of work created in that uniquely diasporic culture space, a world comprised of these in-between worlds to put it more succinctly in Yiddish, a Welt mit Weltlach. This has developed into an ongoing project exploring musical and textual spaces where Black and Jewish expression are experienced simultaneously, not for the purpose of easy conflation, but in order to summon a space of expressive and creative achdus, einigkeit, of unity, something I've termed for myself as a Black Yiddishkeit. For me, that began with brief essays into exchanges of text and melody that could sustain a constant movement between languages and modes and histories in order to establish a coherent mood. One of the first of these was a piece that combined two evocations of specifically American ethnic religiosity, the 19th century spiritual, My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord, and American Jewish composer Israel Goldfarb's Yantif setting of a text from Psalms, Va'ani Tefilati. I wanted to establish a mood of connection to God that only made sense in these parameters of Jewishness and blackness, to try to develop my own vocabulary out of musical spiritual vocabularies that had been articulated on the American soil. This next video is a short excerpt from that piece, Anchored. <laughs>
All of this led to Convergence, an EP I recorded with the groundbreaking klezmer trio Varetsky Pass, who were able to paint a musically coherent environment for me to explore a hundred years of African-American and Ashkenazi Jewish music, moving confidently from the doinas of Bessarabia to the reels of Appalachia, shifting easily between Biloxi and Budapest. Even with these amazing musicians, I still tended to place these different kinds of music hermetically side by side. Lately, I've tried to create melodies of my own that can conceivably exist firmly within both traditions. This last example, which I composed and recorded a few months ago, attempts to stand directly between the wordless melodies of the Hasidim and the Black Southern Field Call, Jewish Responsive Prayer, and the African-American Call and Response Worth Song, Synagogue Modal Music and Pentatonic Scales Freighted from Africa. This last piece is called Nigen Number no. Five. Um, wow. Hello. Um, first of all, um, I'm really excited to be here in conversation with these esteemed colleagues. So thank you so much for having me. So I'm just going to jump in and say I'm both a performer and an academic. And those are separate but certainly related strands. The concept of encounter, which um, I've chosen to speak about, actually encompasses much of the motivation behind both of these strands. As a scholar, most of my writings have centered around Mizrahi music in Israel and cultural politics. And very recently, I've begun writing about a nascent but powerful movement in the United States over the past few years of young, politically left Jews of Middle Eastern and North African background connecting to their heritages and many of them connecting with these heritages for the first time. Artistically, I've been performing since I was a child, but my focus on Jewish music from the Middle East and North Africa, some of which includes my own Persian Jewish heritage, has occurred over the past 21 years here in the US and in many ways grew out of my academic pursuits. When I started performing, not only were there very few musicians performing Middle Eastern and North African Jewish music, but many non-Jews and even some Jews barely knew that Jews in the Middle East existed. And um, I actually started performing Middle Eastern uh, Jewish music in Austin, Texas as a grad student to give you some background there. 
So in terms of encounters, first, when I founded my all-female group, Divan, the goal of having people in the U.S. encounter the idea of non-Western Jews via music was an important goal, learning that Jewish music didn't have to equal klezmer music, for example. The second encounter is that I wanted to promote the idea that people living in the Middle East and North Africa whether they were Jews, Muslims, Christians, Zoroastrians, or et cetera, primarily shared the same culture. Through music, this comes through in a really straightforward way, these everyday encounters between Muslims and Jews. And one more encounter that is very resonant in both my artistic and academic work, both in Israel and now in the United States, is a generational one. Here, I'm referring to the desire to connect with this Middle Eastern heritage that in some ways is now inaccessible, though we try to grasp it in whatever ways we, and by we, I mean second and third generation Jews, in, what are, in whatever ways we can. So I'm going to introduce and then play you a video clip that very clearly highlights all of these encounter moments that I mentioned earlier. So it's a video clip from my solo project, Mona Jat, which I was commissioned to create some years ago, and I'm finally recording this year through the generosity of Indiana University's Jewish Studies program. My grandfather was a renowned singer of Persian classical music in Iran, and one of the few recordings that my family has of my grandfather singing in Hebrew, um, as opposed to in Persian, is a recording of him leading slichot services in Iran. And uh, just as background, slichot is a ritual of songs sung late at night for about a month, um, every single night before the Jewish high holidays. So in this project, I reimagined Slichot with both the recordings of my grandfather and things I've composed. In this clip, I'm actually singing one of the prayers responsively with my grandfather, and then it moves to a moment I'm narrating with my grandfather singing in the background. And you'll hear one of the incredible musicians I perform with named Zafer Tawil singing the Muslim call to prayer in the background as well. And if we could please hear that clip, see that video clip. <laughs> chanted on one Saturday night preceding the Jewish New Year. In Middle Eastern Jewish practice, however, these poetic prayers of supplication or slichot are chanted for an entire month preceding the Jewish New Year, sometime between midnight and dawn. In the Persian tradition, Jews gather around 4 a.m. and chant these prayers until sunrise, around the same time that Muslims arise to say the morning prayers. My, my family remembers hearing the sounds of the Muslim call to prayer wafting from the mosques as they chanted their own prayers of Slichot 
in Tehran. Thank you. And I think I'll just end there for now and we can go on to show Magid so I don't go over time. Thank you. That was fantastic. Wow. Um, I'd like to just sit and listen to that for a little while or longer. So my um, contribution here is a little bit different, although it can actually tie in a little bit to some things that Anthony said. Uh, my interest is in um, old time Appalachian music. I'm a Clarham, a banjo player. And I want, I want to frame my remarks really by telling a story. And that is a story that connects the old time Appalachian tradition and klezmer music. But before I do that, I want to, I want to just say that there's um, uh, a kind of nexus between what was the, called the folk revival in the late 1950s and early 1960s and a group of musicians that lived in uh, North Carolina and Virginia and West Virginia and Appalachia. And there's a kind of connection between them. And strangely enough, we'll see that klezmer will come out of it. So in, in terms of the, the folk revival, many of you know that there were many, many prominent Jews who were involved in it. I could just offer a few names. Um, Izzy Young, who founded the Folklore Center on West 3rd Street in 1957. Mo Ash, the son of Sholem Ash, the great Yiddish and Hebrew writer, who was um, the founder of Folk Ways Records. Um, Milt Oaken, Seymour Solomon, the founder of Vanguard Records, Erwin Silber, who founded the magazine Shout Out, which was the great folk magazine, and, and the musicians like, like, um, like John Cohn of the New Lost City Ramblers, and many Jews were involved in this folk revival process, of course, Theodore, Theodore Bekel and others. Um, so a lot of Jews ended up, for a variety of reasons, making their way down to Appalachia because they had heard that there was some music there that had not been recorded and they felt like if it was not going to be recorded, it was going to be lost. And so a bunch of musicians end up going down there and spending a fair amount of time with these musicians who were really living far into the mountains and had traditions that went back to the Civil War. And the connect, some of the connection to what Anthony said is that a lot of this old time Appalachian music is really an interesting combination between Irish and Scottish tunes that many of the, their ancestors had brought over and um, slave music that had come from the South up into the Appalachian Mountains. So there's this connection between kind of the African-American experience, uh, which is really in a certain sense where the banjo comes from, banjo is an African instrument, and some of this kind of Scottish and Irish music that's happening at the same time. So I wanna play two clips for you. And the first clip is a clip of two musicians, one named um, Tommy Jarrow, who's playing fiddle, and the other one named Fred Cockerham, who's playing fretless banjo. And I'll explain fretless banjo after the clip. And what's interesting about the, the mute was, it was, it was made, in the, the video was made in 1971. And Jarrow was born in 1903 and had learned music from a variety of sources, including ex-slaves, Confederate soldiers, and so on. And there's a connection between Tommy Jarrell and the next clip that I want to play right afterwards by a contemporary musician named Hank Sapuznik. Anybody that knows klezmer music knows Hank Sapuznik. He was one of the founders of the klezmer revival. And there's an encounter that happens between Tommy Jarrell and Hank Sapuznik in the, in the 1960s that I want to kind of uh, frame, I want to speak about that encounter and what, what comes from it. So, um, Let's do the clips first and then I'll come back and, 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 and tell, tell the story. So let's play and the, the, the Tommy Jarrow and Fred Cockerham clip. They're playing a, a tune called Breaking Up Christmas. Breaking Up Christmas was an old Appalachian tune. I'll explain where it comes from um, after we hear the clip. <laughs> All 
I pray this play a little of Breaking Next Christmas. Let's hear the second. Let's hear the second clip by. Uh, this is now by uh, Hank Sapuznik, and it was it was from the 2016 Midwest Banjo Camp, Banjo and Fiddle Camp, that's run by Ken Perlman. So I thought I would do uh, a piece um, that um, piece from uh, Yiddish vaudeville. Uh, it's from a recording from 1925. It's a song uh, I uh, translated about 20 years ago, and. Uh, it's in Yiddish, but uh, you'll be able to figure out which is the English translation. It's tucked in neatly into the middle, and the song is called I Am a Roommate at My Wife's. Ich bin schon wieder single, pizza via jingle, mit mein Weibel hab ich sehr gekehrt. Thanks. Um, so, okay, so here's the story. So I have time for the sto quick, the quick, the quick story. So Hank was an old time musician uh, because as, as you can, you can imagine the banjo is not, a is not an instrument for, uh, for klezmer music or for Yiddish music. Uh, so Hank was an old time musician and he went down to visit Tommy Jarrell to learn from him. And they were sitting with a bunch of other musicians at a dinner that Tommy Jarrell's wife, who was in the video, made. And so there's this kind of, you know, pot or bowl of ham hocks or some such dish that's going around the table. And it comes to Hank and Hank just kind of passes and doesn't take any. Not because Hank was kosher, um, just didn't want to eat the dish of ham hocks. So Tommy says to Hank, Hank, uh, do you want some of this ham hocks? And he said, no, no, thank you, Tommy. And after a minute or so, Tommy says, Hank, are you some kind of Jew? And Hank says, uh, 
Yeah, actually, actually, uh, actually, I am. I mean, the Hank looks pretty Jewish. The fact that Tommy couldn't tell shows you how deep in the mountains they actually were. In any event, sometime afterward, the after playing a, a song, Hank, uh, Tommy turns to Hank and says, don't you people have your own music? And it was a kind of passing remark. They continued to play. Hank ends up going back up north and he really never forgot that question. And the result of that question was Hank basically beginning the Klezmer revival in America. So in this kind of quasi, I don't know if it was an anti-Semitic remark by, by a, a guy living in the Appalachian mountains asking Hank why he's coming and kind of playing the, the old time music as opposed to his own music kind of created a kind of renaissance of klezmer music in America. So I just want to kind of end there. And uh, I think it's an interesting anecdote, although interestingly, it's a kind of folklorist in a way that there are many different versions of the story. I've heard about five or six versions. I just told you one of them. Anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you all so much. Incredible, um, incredible openings for this conversation. Um, really rich and all in, in dialogue with each other in some wonderful ways. Um, Shaul, I was convinced when I was when I realized the name of that that the first song you played, uh, "Breaking Up Christmas," was like the must be the one Christmas song that Jews didn't write. So that was a good one. <laughs> that was a really good one it, because it was too anti-Christmas for a Jewish songwriter to write right. it. You know, breaking of Christmas is a, is, a, is a tradition in the Appalachian Mountains that from tw from from December 25th for 12 days is like a party and people go from house to house and play music together and share meals. So that's the kind of it's called breaking up Christmas. It actually has its own festival name. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to it's like the new the new Festivus. It's great. Um, uh, I want to go back to something that Anthony, um, a, a phrase that Anthony used that I wanted to kind of reintroduce into the conversation. Um, and um, it was the, the combination of, of the phrase uh, foot sore and fancy free. And the, there is these, the, 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 the kind of repeated um, theme and reference throughout all of your presentations um, around these issues of, of soreness, of, of pain, of struggle, of uh, enclosure and limits, um, enslavement, um, with the desire for fugitivity, the desire um, for freedom, the enactment of fugitivity. And I'm wondering if you could all just talk a little bit more about those themes for you in your work uh, or in, in the music that um, you listen to in the way that you think about Jewish music. Um, the, the kind of deep connection between um, the history of stopping movement uh, and the history of desiring to move freely. Maybe Anthony, you want to start since I, I started with your phrase. Sure. So um, I hate to um, bring this up, but Passover is going to be here in no time. <laughs> and um, in the Magid section of uh, the Passover Haggadah, uh, it says that anyone who is able to expound upon the story of the Exodus should be blessed, uh, should be worthy of praise. And there's this curious sort of coincidence that um, the lives and culture of Black people in the United States feels like an exposition on the story of the Exodus. And in that sense, the story becomes much larger than just the narrative of a small group of people, you know, somewhere in the Levant. Um, it becomes this um, opportunity for, for liberation. Um, it becomes in a sense, um, a, li a living midrash as it were. And the music sort of inhabits that space too. It moves from beyond its original uh, moorings as just a, a text and becomes culture becomes destiny um and i think like personally i think there's like that desire for freedom sounds a certain way mm -hmm. and i think those sounds in different cultures have an affinity for each other so I, i've never been surprised actually to find that there have been you know black performers who had an affinity for jewish music and vice versa because i feel like they're they're just kind of spiritual connections that are there um 
there's a there's a fugitivity you know this this con kind of constant desiring for for freedom but also you know having this this concept of a uh, diaspora constantly in you know the background of everything that you're doing coming from a place um where you aren't presently and having the the sounds of that in your music kind of longing um and it's also kind of diaspora from god you know there's a longing for god that is also in that music um and that you can find in both african-american and jewish music there's there's a lot there yeah wonderful um the desire for freedom sounds a certain way um and also just that's just such a rich notion and rich idea i'm wondering um in your work um uh Galit, does that resonate for you? This this idea of freedom uh, sounding a certain way uh, in the face of the lack of or the denial of that freedom. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so many of the themes actually that Anthony brought up really resonate um, in my work in different ways. Um, so, themes first of all of being like you know being a fugitive. Um, and looking for, you know, he mentioned uh, diaspora and longing, you know, it's a big one for me as an anthropologist, because both in Israel and in the US in recent years, um, in my own work, there, there is a longing for knowing some of these countries that Jews of the Middle East and North Africa really can't, um, can't uh, visit again this these countries of their parents and um, or of their grandparents, you know, whether it's Egypt or Iraq or Iran or um, Morocco, I guess, is one of the few places that that people can go to. Um, but for most of us, these um, these countries are are off limits. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of longing and there's a lot of pain in a lot of the of the work that you see. And I started doing this research with um, Mizrahim in Israel um, over 20 years ago, as they were, um, these young people were kind of excavating this, um, these musical traditions that they in many ways were cut off from. And, um, you know, they actually were fugitives and in many, in many instances, they had to leave these countries um, and had no choice in, in many cases, but to come to Israel. And so there was this uh, after after, you know, a generation of being in Israel and, you know, the discrimination that they experienced in Israel, they started um, really trying to excavate and learn about the musical traditions that they had in these different countries. And now in the US, um, just now, these kinds of same things are happening. The history is very different, of course, because um, there wasn't this uh, state sponsored discrimination campaign. But, um, you know, here in the United States, there just aren't, there isn't a lot of, um, there aren't a lot, first of all, of Middle Eastern North African Jews as there are in Israel. So there's that. And um, so it's a very Ashkenazi worldview and sound. And so now you have, it's just interesting for me now to do this comparative work to see these young people now that I'm starting to write about who are, um, you know, connecting to their family roots and wanting to do some of the work that I did um, lo a long, much longer ago, in part because of my academic work. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I could continue, but I'll stop yes. there. And we will, because you raised some points I want to absolutely <laughs> return to in a second. Um, but I want to continue on this really quickly with <laughs> Shaul. And I'm wondering, Shaul, with, with, um, with the banjo even as an instrument, you already mentioned it, of course, as an African instrument. Um, is it possible for you that that instrument itself contains um, those histories of of a desire for freedom, histories of fugitivity, it, kind of all within the history of that instrument itself and the many ways it's been taken up in Appalachia and beyond? Kind of unmute you. I think you're still muted, Chow. Sorry. Yes, I think that one of the interesting things about the banjo as an instrument is that it performs as a string instrument and a percussive instrument simultaneously. And that that was its use um, both in, 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 in music during slavery and also in jazz music in the, in the teens in the 1920s in New Orleans. And I think it does, it has a, it has a certain quality that, that um, 
I don't know if I would call it fugitive music. I I, I just think that it's a it's a it's an ins the instrument itself has its own kind of syncreticity. You know, as it's moving from being a stringed gourd to a music of slaves to a music of people in Appalachia who were quite racist, right? So there's all this kind of moving back and forth between people and communities and genres and the banjo kind of followed from slave spirituals to jazz to old time music to bluegrass to klezmer it seems to be a kind of adaptable adaptable instrument i just wanted to quickly relate to just to a couple of things that, that anthony galit said I, I mean i think that music um i mean I'm, I'm i have a kind of syncretistic inclination anyway in general but i think that music is naturally syncretistic there's no way to deny the fact that there are permeable boundaries between one culture and another culture, one people and another people, one religion and another religion in music. You can argue how that functions ritually or liturgically or, or otherwise, but music is clearly a kind of syncretistic enterprise. And I think that one of the reasons is, and this is specifically with folk music, is that it lends itself to storytelling in a very particular kind of way. And I think the musicality of the storytelling draws from the kind of similar experiences of slaves, impoverished people in Appalachia, um, you know, the nostalgia of, of the impoverished Eastern European Jews. I mean, there's a shared experience that enables that music to flow very easily from one tradition into mm -hmm. another. And yet for all of that syncretism, which I think, you know, anyone who is a, an honest and true music fan uh, and an honest and true maker of music knows that, I mean, that, that you're absolutely right, right? That syncretic um, uh, aspect is at the heart of what music is. And yet, at least in the United States, in my opinion, the history has not been uh, one of um, industrializing or marketing syncretism, but the opposite of, of creating segregation uh, in many ways where segregation didn't exist at the cultural level in some cases. Right. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we when I listen to, you know, uh, uh, the stories of Galit about particularly Mizrahi identity, non-Western Jews, um, I think that's a really clear example of where the syncretism throughout the Levant, um, throughout Al-Sham, right, has, that has became part of, you know, segregating all of those identities, creating, um, in a way, false separations between identities becomes a mechanism of the state. Um, and that music can actually um, almost work against all the things that we love about it um, in that way. So I wanted to return to that that topic. And I know, you know, leading up to this, I had asked everybody to think about the relationship between Jewish music and whiteness um, in general. And Galit, you know, and uh, you know, had responded and said that you really wanted to talk about, and I'm so glad you used this term, uh, um, Ashka normativity. Um, and, you know, this is something that in my own writing on Jewish American music, um, I, I'm absolutely guilty of, 100%. Um, if I look back at work that I did 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, and a lot of my own um, intellectual and scholarly journey over the last 10 years has been completely revising that view. So I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit, um, kind of all of us, uh, around these questions of Ashka normativity, around whiteness, around the kind of racial codings of what gets called Jewish music in the context of the U.S. Maybe, Galit, you want to start off? And unmute. There you go. Sure. Um, where to begin? Um, it's a tiny topic, Galit. Come on. Yeah. You know. I mean, really, I don't have anything to say um, <laughs> about it. Um, look, uh, <laughs> there are, you know, I think people generally mean well um, and want to. Um, oftentimes want to want to learn about other um, musical traditions. But if you're so rooted in, um, you know, an Ashkenazi in a Western worldview, you know, like, for example, I worked at um, the, the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, you know, I was a professor there for a couple years, which was a really wonderful experience um, on many levels. Um, but, you know, talking about, and this is really it, any, um, uh, let's say, you know, in any cantorial school or, um, you know, big Jewish institution, when you talk about Jewish Nusach, 
you know, um, people just automatically assume that you're talking about, you know, Western Jewish Nusaf. There is no, it's like, there is no other um, entity. Uh, and so uh, just getting people to think about um, the fact that there are other Jews who, um, for whom this, this Nusach that you're calling, you know, the, the Nusach is not their, their experience. And so I just feel like I've spent, um, you know, my entire, um, academic and, um, <laughs> an artistic career really trying to, um, uh, trying to do that work. So, yeah. um, Yes, where 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 to go with that? Um, there, there's well, there's so much to say. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think at least in the context of the U.S., right? Um, th there has been historically a kind of, or at least since the 1950s, a kind of normalization of Jewish with Ashkenazic or with whiteness. Um, Anthony, I'm wondering, particularly because your work is um, diving into these traditions and ways of making and experiencing song, not to bring two separate things together, um, but to actually, um, at least as, as, as I'm hearing it, um, inhabit them um, through each other, uh, which is a very different process. And, um, and I'm wondering if you could just talk about how these issues play um, for you and your work. It's interesting because I've often posited myself as a a critic of the concept of Ashkenormativity because, not because it doesn't exist, very much it exists, but rather the contents of, of Ashkenormativity more often than not as I've experienced them are a Ashkenazi flavored parochial American Jewishness mm -hmm. and that Ashkenazi culture is made up of specificities mm -hmm. uh, of flavors and toms that this kind of basic parochial American Judaism lacks. It's a flattening mm -hmm. of culture, the simplification of culture in order that it can be more easily disseminated um, in various educational spaces and Jewish institutions. And in that sense, I think there's a kind of a, a difference. I mean, for everybody, who can you know, walk around and say schlep and schmuck and whatever else, they can't walk to a, a, you know, a blackboard and actually write those in Yiddish oisius. They can't write them in Hebrew letters. They don't know how the words are spelled in Hebrew letters. There's a certain lack of connection that they have with the specificity of what Ashkenazi culture actually is. What they have is American Jewish culture and those contents do tend to be white and they tend to be to some degree relatively shallow as far as the places that they could go with the very specificities that the, at least I found in Ashka, um, Ashkenazi Jewish culture. So it's complicated because it's like, you know, um, American Jews are very parochial. They know about American Jewish things. Those things are Ashkenazi flavored, intensely so. And I think if you come from outside of that tradition, it's very, alienating because you know what are you supposed to do with that there's no knowledge about any other kind of jewish culture and then there's kind of like this weird sort of pervasive racializing around any culture that isn't ashkenazi jewish culture i've had a few times people say oh well you know i thought you would sing sephardic music or i thought you would sing in ladino as if i'm supposed to have some kind of relationship to ladino as somebody whose uh you know roots you know my family are from a small shtetl on the border of Louisiana and Texas. Like, what do I know from Ladino? Um, but, you know, in, in the American Jewish mind, it's racialized as other, and me being obviously other, the idea is that that should appeal to me. And it's this, it's this kind of thinking, this parochial American thinking that I think um, Jewish culture makers often run aground of, especially ones who come from traditions other than um, an Ashkenazi Jewish tradition. I'm I'm wondering, Shaul, have you found, particularly with your um, interest and in your work on um, American folk music, um, particularly the folk movement that that you spoke about, that th that seems to me to to have been a, a a time and a place where a lot of these separations and debates were actually being actively kind of worked out in some ways or explored openly. Yeah, I think that's true. Look, I think folk musicians are generally deviants of institutional conformity. 
I think that's just the nature of the, of the game. They're border crossers. And so in a sense, um, it does, I don't know if it work, I don't know if it's working it out. It's certainly um, engaging in, in, in border, borderlands practices of moving and exploring how other cultures are telling their stories and the sounds that they use to tell those stories and then adapting them to, to various genres. So in a certain sense, all folk musicians are thieves by definition. Everybody is stealing from everybody else. That's just the nature of the enterprise. That's what makes it so explosive and that's what makes it so creative. And in a sense, there's, you know, it, it, it makes sense that a lot of the folk revival also comes out of political radicalism yep. and socialism, right? So there's a, there's a political component to the, the breaking down of those barriers, especially around the question of race in the 1950s during Jim Crow and musicians, folk musicians, black musicians, white musicians were traveling together and, and trying to you know, play in the same places. So yeah, I mean, there is, I, I mean, I think that syncretism that I talked about really expresses itself in a certain so kind of deviance of conformity. And that, that's what makes folk music so creative. It also is what makes it so dangerous in some way. And so, um, so much of a challenge to the institutional, the institutions that are, um, that are trying to kind of make it happen and make money from it. So then you go into the kind of music business yeah. and the way in which, uh, you know, rock and roll just, just kills the folk revival because the industry decided that it can make more money by recording, you know, rock musicians rather than folk musicians. So, you know, that's, and, and some of those folk musicians remain very, very dedicated to the folk tradition and simply wouldn't buy into the, into the uh, industrial, music industrial complex, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I've got like five pages worth of notes and questions and I just looked at the clock and we were almost at an hour, but I wanna get one more question in. Um, uh, and, and, and that is a, maybe a wider angle question, which is about the, the kind of interplay or relationship between um, religion and secularism. Um, and in particular, I started in, anticip in anticip anticipation of today thinking about, you know, um, in a very reductive way, um, secular music that can have a religious following, probably the biggest a most obvious example there being the Grateful Dead, um, or religious music that can be put to secular uses. Uh, and certainly in the history of um, the civil rights movement, the history of the enslaved fighting against um, uh, the enclosures of the plantation, um, or even the way a song like, you know, a Kol Nidre become, can become almost secular, can become a kind of um, uh, identity marker that might not actually be directly related to some people um, to a synagogue. Um, I'm just wondering if you could all talk again. I know these are huge topics and you all have thought a lot about this, but about how those two forces um, meet up and inform each other. And maybe Shaul, if you want to start this time, since you're already there, right there. Oh yeah. Start. So yeah, I mean, I, I could, I could talk about the Grateful Dead for a long time, but I'm, but I'm not going to do that. But I will say that that if you think about the Grateful Dead and take them seriously as musicians, I mean, their group of people, especially Jerry Garcia, who learned to play banjo in Bloomington, Indiana in the 1960s and started out as a bluegrass musician and only later kind of got onto the kind of the rock and roll bandwagon. I think that it's interesting that that particular kind of music, which it's interesting that you say it. it. It's a secular music that has a spiritual component, but it has a spiritual component precisely in the way it's kind of an anti-religious component. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's kind of breaking down that spiritual, but it's, it's, it's advocating that spiritual, but not religious, and trying to recreate a, um, a religious feeling or a spiritual feeling, not only through the music, but through the audience itself. Right. So, for example, if you look at like if you were looking at the, the video that I, I showed on Breaking Up Christmas. Right. The thing about that kind of music is that it wasn't music that was ever performed for an audience. It was music that was performed for contra dances, mm -hmm. which is why it's so repetitive. Right. So these musicians were actually, in a sense, engaging in some kind of ritual act. They were the accompanying 
soundtrack to a ritual act, which was the contra dance. And the contra dance wasn't a religious act itself, but it, it had a certain kind of spirituality to it in that it was the time when people gathered together. It was the time of sociality. It was the time when, when poor people were able to actually celebrate the little bit that they had to celebrate. So I think that in a way, you know, bands like the Grateful Dead were able to kind of intuitively get that particular ele folk element and then kind of create a big sound out of it. And the big sound out of it then created a movement and the movement itself had its own kind of religious uh, connotations. Absolutely, thank you. Um, any, anyone else want to chime in on this? How about you, Galit? Yeah, I have so much to say um, <laughs> on this topic. First of all, um, the line between you know secular and religion in the Middle East is much more fluid. So, um, so for example, I mean, so many examples, but for example, my grandfather um, performed um, his Persian classical music. The, what lyrics did he use for his you know, Persian improvisations? He used you know, Hafez and Rumi, and who, were, who were mystical um, poets. Uh, you know, Sufi poets, but these were the poems of the secular world. So, okay, so there's already that, you know, um, that uh, sort of just doesn't define in the same way that we define secular. And then finally, I just have to say that, um, you know, the whole concept of piyut in, um, in the tradition of the Middle East and North Africa are these songs, these religious um, uh, uh, sacred songs and the music, though, you use songs from the, again, secular world. So you take songs, and you um, and you bring them into the religious world. But the Jews, who the people who performed the music, so many of them were Jews. So it's not as if they were taking songs. I mean, they they were um, in the Islamic world, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, etc., the perpetuators of music in the Middle East and North Africa. So they took the music they were already performing, and then they brought it into the religious world. And so there was, there is that fluidity, but it reminded me of when Shaul said, you know, um, don't you people have your own music? You know, when someone said that, uh, uh, you know, occasionally Jews, people will, um, uh, people from the Middle East who, who are not knowledgeable of the history of Jews in the Middle East will say, well, why were they taking music from the secular world, not realizing that they were actually, you know, they were so much so important a part of the, um, the perpetuating of, of the musical traditions themselves. And I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you. Anthony. Yes, I've, I've actually encountered uh, the fact that uh, at least in, in the Middle East and North Africa, Jews, in a sense, were the curators of these um, kinds of music that um, the prevailing uh, Arabic culture had even left behind. So if you wanted to hear the oldest versions of an Arabic melody, you would actually go to Jews who had taken that melody and applied it to various kinds of piyutim. And I think this is a function of where Jews existed in various societies, not only in Middle East and, and um, in North Africa, but in Eastern Europe and in America as well. Um, this kind of um, middle place where they're able to adopt, adapt, and disseminate the music of the people amongst whom they live. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting, you know, we had gone, we've gone about an hour, we, well, we've gone over an hour without Hava Nagila coming up with it, which is a record. Um, uh, Anthony's very happy. Um, uh, but, Not a but, record in my world. <laughs> but I, oh, it's so sadly a record in mine. Um, I I do though, however, want to want to bring up Havana Gila because it actually strikes me here is actually a perfect example uh, that that joins all the, th the everything we've just heard, particularly in that last set of responses of um, a religious song that becomes quote unquote secularized as a political song um, that then travels to the US and enters the popular consciousness of American listeners um, through the folk movement, um, particularly Harry Belafonte on the stage of Carnegie Hall, um, and becomes a song that is known as the most quote unquote 
Jewish song ever, and so many people don't know its history and don't know what it means, right? And so all of these migrations um, and all of these movements between the, the religious and the secular, um, there are so many different songs that can actually help us unpack that. Um, you know, in the q and I've been following a lot of the amazing um, comments and, 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 and questions, and, and somebody posed one thing that I, I just want to underline here, which is, um, you know, to what extent is, you know, any of the music that we're talking about that might not be obviously from the United States, um, how is that American Jewish music? And I think one of the things that has given me such joy in this conversation and has been so energizing and inspirational is that, in fact, what you all landed on without anyone pushing you to uh, is that what makes American Jewish music, American Jewish music is the encounter. Um, and in fact, it is the encounter that is not the outlier. The encounter is the center. Um, it, it, it is the, the, the very definition uh, of any discussion trying to break down those terms. So I'm just so grateful to all of you for uh, helping us think through it in a what, what, what felt like a compressed amount of time, but I feel like we got so much wonderful um, examples and thinking. Um, so I just want to thank you all, and I want to thank Anne for um, opening the door here and letting us uh, you know, have this opportunity to start thinking about this together. And I hope we can all continue to have this conversation uh, after the Zoom ends. Looks Josh, like can I, say, can I yes. say one thing about Hava Nagila? So, because uh, I is had the best clothes right there. Do you but, see that? The finish oh, that I had. Oh, man. Okay. I'm not going to take it. No, go for it. Go for it. No. So it's over. If, if you want to really, really get at the, 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 the spirituality of Hanvan Nagila, because it's a song from the Dinavert Sanzer yep. uh, um, Hasidic tradition, slow it way, way down, as slow as you can. And when you do that, you can hear that it's a Shalshudas Nigun. That you, you completely lose it when you speed it up. Just slow it, just sing the Nigun and just sing it way. We do this on Kabbalat Shabbat. Uh, on Fire Island at my shul with Basi Schechter. And when we slow it way down, people don't even know what's happening in the Gila yep. until they get halfway through it. Anyway, I didn't want to ruin your fantastic That's clothes. okay. You know, that, that same thing happened to me when someone about five years ago took a Justin Bieber song and slowed it down to about 25 minutes. So it was really long. <laughs> and that became my spiritual experience for the day. So <laughs> I found a new That's finish. even better clothes. I honestly. found a new finish. Go ahead, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the true encounter. <laughs> Um, I just really want to thank everybody for being here. This was such a pleasure for me. You, I, I was off camera, but I was, I've was i been smiling the whole time. So um, really, it's been lovely. You all are brilliant. And I thank everybody for, for joining us tonight. And I hope I will be able to see you all sometime in person in the future. Thank you, Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you, Josh, too. It was fantastic.